Good morning, and once again, welcome. This is Sunday, April the 19th, 2020. Uh, we are continuing the studies from home as we are continuing to deal with this pandemic in our society. I want to welcome all who are tuning in this morning or throughout this week if you are viewing this at a later time. As always, I am honored to, to have an opportunity to share with you another portion of the Word of God today as we strive to worship Him even though we are uh, unable to assemble together as we normally do and we certainly look forward to that day and we hope that it comes very soon that we can resume our normal activities and, and may this time be such that we do not take for granted the privilege we have of being able to openly and publicly gather together and praise God and to share him with others. In the meantime, we will study God's Word today, but before we do that, just a couple of other announcements that I want to mention. Um, one is just a reminder to those who are members of the church here in Bellflower that this past Wednesday night we uh, resumed our Bible studies at 7.30, even though we have been doing so online. Uh, Frank is leading us uh, by way of WebEx, which is, which is an app that's available where you can either call in and listen to the study over the phone or, or if you have a camera and the ability you can actually uh, hook up your camera and and you can uh, participate that way as well so that's 7 30 on wednesday night if you have any questions about that contact me or contact frank or or jerry and we will do our best to get you set up so that you can join us with that and along with that next sunday morning we are going to uh continue or extend that Bible study and start doing it on Sunday mornings as well until we're able to get together. And we're going to do that at 10 o'clock in the morning. And then, of course, I will also continue to record these lessons, uh, two lessons each Sunday, until we are uh, once again together. So uh, with that in mind, welcome to everybody. The other thing that I wanted to say that uh, if you are joining us at another time and if you have questions about something that are said in this lesson, as is always the case, I want to encourage you to contact me. You can go to our website, uh, roseavenue.org, www.roseavenue.org, and that's spelt out at, like that. And um, you can uh, send a question to preacher at roseavenue.org, and I will get that question, and I will be more than happy to answer any Bible questions that you bring my way. And if you desire a further study, let me know, and I will do what I can for you with that. Having said all that, let's get to the lesson at hand. You may recall last week that we presented a lesson dealing with the subject of hope. And we noted in that particular lesson that, uh, that we talked about where is your hope. We defined what hope is, noting that hope is a, a well-grounded expectation of something yet future. And in reality, hope consists of two different qualities. It consists of desire and expectation. And both of those are, are there where we have hope. In addition to that, we also talked about uh, while this world lives without hopes, for Christians, hope is, is an expectation of something that is better than whatever this life has to offer. Following that, we noted that hope is, is a word that is found about 150 times in the Bible, at least in the New King James Version. The word is used a little over 150 times, and it's almost evenly split between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We noted a few verses that help us to understand hope. We talked about Romans 8, 24 and 25, which uh, which notes that hope is based upon that which is unseen. And then in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1, we, uh, where the Hebrew writer talks about faith, he says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, or the assurance of things hoped for. And so we see in that that faith builds our hope. And I want to elaborate a little more on that just a, in a couple of minutes in, in our lesson today. But we also noticed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 that our hope sets us apart from those in the world. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 talks about those who, who have no hope uh, and all they're living for is this life. 
And then finally, we concluded with 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, a, a passage that doesn't mention the word hope, but, but, but Paul there, as he realizes that his time on this earth is over and he's, he's about to go and be with God, says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. That's hope. You, Paul has this hope. We then focused on how hope comes from various sources. First of all, it comes from God himself. God is a God of hope. And if, if we can uh, wrap our minds around who God is and that there is a God, we have reason to hope. And he gives us reason to hope. And his word tells us how to hope in him. And then we focused on the coming of Jesus to this earth. Everything that Jesus did was designed to give us a hope. And we focused quite a bit of time on the resurrection. One event that if you establish the resurrection, you establish the faith of a Christian. You establish the reason for our hope. And finally, we talked about how hope is uh, uh, we have hope in his return. The fact that there's more to our lives than this life. And so we are looking forward to something better when this life is over. So that's what we talked about last week. And this week we want to continue our study, but we want to ask the question, what can hope do for you? As I was preparing this lesson, uh, beginning to prepare this lesson a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I came across several things associated with the word hope that, uh, that are just descriptions of ways that it can make us better and, th and ways that it can impact our lives. And that's what the focus of this particular lesson is going to be about. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started talking about what can hope do for you? And I want to begin by talking about hope is something that can give you faith. You may recall that last week we talked about how faith, uh, faith is, a, a, is a product of hope. Uh, and uh, we have hope and that's what gives, uh, 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 we, we have faith and that's what gives us hope. Uh, but equal to that, uh, hope gives us faith. It gives us reason to believe. Over in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, Paul there says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So Paul here makes the point as he's praying to God, uh, he talks about uh, their faith in Christ Jesus and, and their love for all the saints because of the hope that they had laid up in heaven. They, they anticipated something better when this life is over, and, and, and that caused them to have a faith to trust in Jesus Christ, even though most, if not all, of those to whom Paul was writing had never seen Jesus. And, and in addition to that, it was something that would prompt them to love their brethren, even in the difficult times, uh, times of uncertainty and, and so on. We talked about Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1 last week again. Uh, and when, when you talk about faith and hope, and I know that I'm, I'm mentioning what I talked about last week, but the thing to understand about this is faith is the assurance of what we hope for. When we have hope, it builds up our faith. And concurrently or, or equally, when we have faith, it builds up our hope. They go hand in hand. This is actually one of those things that if your faith is growing stronger, it's going to increase your hope. And as your hope increases, it's going to increase your faith. So these are things that complement each other. And uh, so the first thing I want to begin with this morning is I want us to note that one thing hope can do for us is it can make our faith stronger. If we will just resolve that we are going to hope for that which we need to hope for. Now the next thing that we find that is associated with hope is that it gives us a peace in this life. Turn over to Romans chapter 15 and in verse number 13. 
Romans chapter 15 and in verse number 13. And we find in this particular text that Paul says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. And he, uh, he, he makes the point there in that particular text uh, where he talks about uh, he talks about uh, a God of hope, and that's in verse number 13. I was actually reading the wrong verse. He says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we find in this scripture that, that our God is a God of hope. And the point that he makes there is, he says, this God of hope, he will fill you with all joy and with peace. Peace is something that we need. Peace is something that we need in so many different ways in this life. We need peace with God. We need peace within ourselves. We, we, we need uh, peace with those of the world. And, and, and we just seem to be living in, in times of anxiety, times of anxiousness. And uh, we need the peace of God there. Over in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul tells us, uh, to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul challenges us to, to, to not be anxious where this life is concerned, but, but, but rather to lay it before God. Lay it before God, and the, and then he makes the point there in verse number seven that the that the peace of God will guard your hearts. What a wonderful thing it is to think about that. You also have Colossians chapter three, and in verse number fifteen, Colossians chapter three, and in verse number fifteen, where where Paul there says, "Let the peace of God rule in your hearts." So, uh, uh, to which also you will be called, in, you were called in one body. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. We need peace. And our hope helps to give us peace. And you know, when you actually think about that, uh, there's something, when you have something to hope for, no matter what you're dealing with, there's a sense of calm that's associated with it. And along with that, we find that hope can be a cause for us to rejoice. It is something that can give us joy where this life is concerned. Again, in Romans chapter 15 and in verse number 13, where Paul talked about this, this God of hope, he says he can fill you with joy and with peace. He can fill you with both of those things. Rejoicing is associated with our hope. Over in Romans chapter 12 and in verse number 12, as, as Paul begins to make some practical application after his doctrinal uh, discussion throughout this book, he, he describes a number of things. And, and there's many things that he just says just very, very quickly as he talks about how how we, uh, we give preference to one another in honor. We, we are not lagging in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the, the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in the Lord. We rejoice because of the hope that we have. You know, when you think about what hope involves, how, how it's about thinking about that which awaits for us, that, that, that ought to be a cause of of joyful anticipation in our lives. You know, I, uh, I can think of instances in our lives where we, where we are, are joyful because of our hope of something that's going to happen, that, that expectation. You know, uh, take for an example, you live a, a distance from your family, and I, I'm not talking just a few miles, but uh, as I do, I, I, live, I live literally thousands of miles away from my family. And we plan vacations, and as those vacations get closer and closer, and you get to that time where you've, uh, uh, you know that you're getting on the airplane the next day, and, and you've made your, 
uh, uh, you've confirmed your reservation and, and you're excited about it. And there's a joy, joyful anticipation of, of seeing your family in the very, very near future. And, and while you're on that plane, you're excited about that fact. Well, think about that from a spiritual standpoint. If our goal is really to reach heaven when this life is over and to spend eternity with God, and, and that is the source of our hope, uh, there's going to be joy associated with that. You know, I, I think of many of the songs that we sing in our book, songs such as uh, Alone at Eve, and when you, when you sing that song, they're walking alone at Eve, viewing the skies above, and the whole point of it is you realize there's something better, and oh, for a home with God, a, a place in His courts to rest. I think of, of songs like How Beautiful Heaven Must Be, you realize we sing these songs to encourage us to, to have hope of something better in spite of what we are dealing with this life. Oh, think of a home over there, or, or, or maybe the song, uh, I'll live on, even though my physical body is wearing out, I'm going to live on. Hope gives us a cause to rejoice. And taking that even a step further, it causes us to rejoice even in the troubling times, even in adversity. When we are facing uncertainty in our life and when we are facing troubles and trials and, and difficulties, hope will help us to get through that. And I remind you of Paul in, in Romans chapter 5 verses 3 through 5 where Paul makes the point there, uh, saying, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Paul makes the point that great good can come out of uh of adversity in our lives and, and tribulations and among those things it can produce hope within us it can give us a reason to hope so you uh, so so hope is one of those things that it helps us as we are dealing with troubling times uh, do you suppose that hope had anything to do with Paul and Silas as they had been beaten in Philippi and they're, they're in prison and they're praying to God and singing praises to him at midnight in the middle of the prison in chains? Or, or maybe the apostles as they leave the, account, uh, the council in Jerusalem, having not only been threatened but also beaten for preaching the cause of Christ in the temple. And it says there in Acts 5 and 41 that, that they left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. Or, or I think about Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 12 and in verse 15 who, who says, I will more gladly spend and be spent, uh, the, though the, the more I do, the less I am loved. He's glad to sacrifice and do whatever he can for them, even though much of what he had done was unappreciated. Joy in adversity uh, is, is a product of hope that is as it ought to be. Hope is what gives us perspective. Hope is what gives us a proper attitude when we are facing uncertain times in this life. So the next thing that I want us to observe about hope, something else is it can cause purification in our lives. It can cause us to, to purify ourselves. Turn over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, where we will notice the first three verses there. And here John says, Beloved, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself, even as He is pure. John, encouraging the brethren there, notes the greatness of the love of God, and he also makes the observation that, that um, uh, it has not yet been revealed what we're going to be like. But we know that when this life is over, 
that when we stand before our Lord, that we're going to be like Him. However, He was changed. That's the degree to which we are going to be changed. So, in other words, we know that we're going to put on a glorious body, something that is better than this. And as a result of that, He says, everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as He is pure. Friends, we need to purify ourselves. Hope gives us a reason to live pure lives. Hope gives us a reason to willingly give up the impurities, uh, uh, many of which this world seems to think are acceptable. Hope will control the way that we dress. You know, our, our hope will cause us to ensure that we're being modest in, in our attire. It, it will control where we go and, and help us to be willing to not to go to certain places. How we use our time, how we, uh, how we speak, uh, what we choose to entertain ourselves. All those things will, will be governed by the hope that we have for a, when this life is over as Christians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and in verse number 1, 2 Corinthians 7 and in verse number 1, and the text leading up to this is, is a text where Paul talks about how uh, we are to come out from among those who are in the world and we are to be separate. And he makes the point there, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul makes the observation, because of the promises we have to look forward to, we cleanse ourselves of all filthiness, perfecting holiness. And that word holiness, if you do a study of that word, it's definitely associated with the idea of uh, of purity in our lives. Hope causes us to purify ourselves. But something else that hope can do for us is it will affect our relationship with others. And among the things that it can do is it can cause us to give a, the benefit of the doubt where others are concerned. I ask you to turn your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse number 7. And in this text we find Paul is describing uh, love, the type of love that we are to have as Christians. Uh, uh, it, it's the, the Greek word agape that we sometimes talk about Christian love. And, and after describing various qualities associated with that love, in verse number 7 Paul says that this love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We live in very pessimistic times. Uh, we live in times where, where, where so many people are negative as they look at what is going on around them. And I want you to understand that when I say we live in pessimistic times, I'm not just talking about this pandemic that we're dealing with now and how discouraged we are in this. Uh, you, you dismiss that. There's so much cynicism around us, and so many people are just negative. People have lost faith in each other uh, as a rule, and a part of that has to do with, with the emphasis on what is so terrible about this life. And, and quite honestly, there's a lot of bad going on around us, and, 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 and some of that lack of faith is deserved when you look at the, uh, the, the poor behavior of, of many people in many various situations. But when we have hope, it, it, it causes us, it causes us to look at things differently. You know, I believe one of the reasons why there is so much pessimism is because we've given up. And when you think about somebody who's given up, what have they done? They lack hope. They lack hope in whatever the situation is, is or, or whoever the person is, whatever they're dealing with, they have no hope that they can get through it successfully. We have hope. We must not give up on people. We need to learn to assume the best. We need to learn to, to, to give the benefit of the doubt you know, until proven otherwise. There's, there's typically two different types of people in this world. There, there are those who, 
who see the bad in everything at all times, and, and that becomes their default disposition. And there are others who, who see the best, and, and when they are disappointed, and when they are let down because of something that someone has done to them, you know, rather than giving up on that person, they, they, they assume, you know, maybe something was going on, uh, and is there a way that I can help them? And that's the attitude that we as Christians ought to have. You know, I, I, I've often said that, that are there times to, to be discouraged? Are there, are there times uh, when frustration is acceptable? I, I believe they are. I mean, Jesus himself, on occasion, you know, after, his, after many of his disciples quit following him, he even asked his apostles, are you going to leave me too? So Jesus became discouraged and so on. But what I want us to understand as Christians is that that, that ought to be the exception rather than the rule of our disposition. We need to be optimistic people. We need to be people willing to give the benefit of the doubt to others. Another quality that is associated with our hope is it can cause us to be willing to defend our faith where others are concerned. In 1 Peter chapter 3, and in verse number 15, Peter there said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. As Christians, we are called upon to give a defense to, to those who ask us, Why do you have this hope that you have? Now, one thing to understand in that, if people are going to ask, Why do you have this hope that you have? What do they need to see? They need to see that there is a hope in our lives, and, and they need to see that there's a reason behind us living the way that we live our lives. When we have a strong hope, we'll be glad to defend that hope. We'll be glad to tell others about why we have this hope. And, 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 and of course, the whole point in this is that we'll tell somebody, yes, I have a hope, and this is what my hope is about, and I want to share it with you. Think about that. Uh, again, over in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and beginning in verse number 9, Paul there says, Therefore we make it our aim whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. For we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. You know, uh, Paul there talks about knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, we, we realize that one day there is going to be a judgment, and everybody is going to stand before that judgment. And when we live our lives in hope, we don't want to keep that to our shell, ourselves. We want to share that with others. I'm reminded of Jesus over in John 4 and in verse number 35 where... He was talking about the, uh, the, the time of harvest. And he was telling his disciples on that occasion that, yes, there's still four months till the actual harvest takes place. But, but he says, but I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And the point that Jesus was making there, he, he wasn't talking about the wheat. Jesus was talking about souls, and he's saying now's the time. Now's the time to go out and reap. Now's the time to sow your seed in hope. Sow your seed in hope that those who, that the heart that receives that seed will be a good and honest heart, and it will produce hope, and that they can spend eternity with you. What was it that Paul said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and, and that's a text where just a few verses earlier he talks about how uh, how uh, I become all things to all men. You know, to the Jews I became as a Jew, to the Gentiles as a Gentile, uh, um, uh, to those who... Uh, 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 he became all things to all men. That's the point that he's making in that particular text. And his goal in that was that he might by 
all means win some. Paul realized he wasn't going to win everyone, but he had a hope. Whenever he talked to somebody, he had a hope that that person would be receptive. Maybe they wouldn't be. Many of them were going to reject them, and I suspect if it's anything like today that the majority rejected Paul, but he didn't give up. He didn't quit. He, with hope, he would just move on to the next one and say, okay, if you don't want it, somebody does, uh, but I'm going to try to teach you. That was Paul's hope. He had hope that others would be willing to respond, and, and, and he was willing to share his hope with others with the hope that they would respond to him. Well, something else that hope will do for us is it will give our lives meaning. It will give our lives purpose. Uh, uh, we, we talked about a little earlier in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 13, which was talked about how we do not sorrow as others do, that have no hope. And over in Hebrews or Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse number 12, Paul here speaking to these brethren and he's talked about this and he's, he's, he's talked about uh, how we are saved by grace through faith and basically he's explaining why we need that. But one of the points he makes in verses 12 and 13, he talked about what you were in times past. He talked about how you were uh, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Paul saying, that's what you were. You were without hope. You are living this life without any hope beyond this life. How truly tragic it is for those who live their lives with no hope beyond this world. But Christians have a real purpose. We have a greater goal than what is in this life. We're not going to live our lives as if all there is is what we have right now. You know, you know, think about that. Uh, th there are so many people today that, that in their minds they say there is no God and, and they live as if there is no God. But, but I, wanna think, I want you to think about what if there is nothing beyond this life? Uh, how sad would that actually be? It doesn't matter what you accomplish. So what? It's meaningless. And, and, and you could come up with a cure for cancer. You could come up with all the greatest things so, so, so that man could expend his life forever. But you know what? It's all temporary. This world, uh, according to the atheist, uh, is, uh, you know, it's just going to disappear one day. And when you die, you're gone. There's nothing beyond this life. There really is no hope. And how many people live their lives hopeless? because they think that all there is, is this life. But that's not the Christian. We have great hope, and it, it's something that's, uh, that's emphasized over and over in Scripture. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, and in verse number 13, Peter there tells us, where he says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully, upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Over in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, this is, uh, this is a great passage that deals with the subject of hope as it talks about hope being an anchor for our soul. And over there in verse uh, 17, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge and lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus Christ, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
There's so much in that verse, but, 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 but the Hebrew writer makes the point there that the hope we have, it is an anchor. And, and as I've noted on uh, even last week, it's tethered in heaven at, the, uh, at, at the, the foot of the throne of God. And that's what we have that is holding us in place. And that's the idea that, it, and it's in the midst of a passage where, where the Hebrew writer is talking about the promises of God that we can anticipate. Over in, over in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse number 5, it talks about the hope that is laid up in, for you in heaven. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and in um, verse number 8, uh, Paul there describing the armor of God talks about the helmet as, as our hope of salvation. So, so hope, it gives our life purpose because we know that there's something beyond this life. And then there's one final quality that I want to talk about related to our purpose in life. And that is hope encourages us to not give up. It encourages us to just keep going, to endure to the end. Problems are, are not the end of the world. We're all going to pray, face problems and we're going to set fat, uh, and face setbacks. Sometimes they're just minimal and, and we just deal with it and, and, and we just move on, uh, uh, brushing something aside. But sometimes our problems become huge. They, they, they become monumental. But we can't quit. We can't quit just because problems arise, no matter how great those problems are. We have to keep going. And the Bible encourages us to, to just keep enduring. Typically, where there are problems, you're going to get through those problems and come out on the other side better. And I will tell you right now that for the Christian, that is always the case. Even if things don't work out in this life, it's going to be better when this life is over. How often in Scripture are, are, are we told not to give up? Why you, you continue in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23, we read there in that text, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hold fast to the confession of your hope. Don't give up your hope. Don't throw it away. And, and after this, he will lead into these verses where he tells uh, some, some of these brethren to exhort one another and not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't abandon your brethren is the point that he makes there. And then he goes on throughout the rest of this chapter and he talks about how you need endurance and you can't give up. And then you have chapter 11 where you have all these examples of faith and, and in every one of those examples we emphasize their faith and rightfully so because the word's used over and over. But I want you to think what about their endurance. Because of their faith, they did not give up. And he even talks about the hope that they have, which caused them to continue to endure and to not give up. In Titus chapter 2, in Titus chapter 2, and in verse number 11, we read there, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You want to know why Christians don't give up? It's because we have a hope beyond this life. The Hebrew writer earlier in that letter, in chapter 3 and verse number 6, encouraged them to, to, uh, to hold fast to our confidence and hope firm to the end. Don't quit is the idea. I, I think of Jesus in Luke chapter 9 and in verse 62 where you have uh, some of his disciples coming to him telling him, we'll follow you wherever, but they started making excuses. And Jesus said there at the end, no one having put his hand to the plow. And looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So there you can see why we need hope in this life. 
Hope can do so many things for us as it sets us apart from the world. And I want to remind you of a verse that we appealed to earlier in this lesson as I bring this lesson to its conclusion. Paul simply said in Hebrews chapter, or Romans chapter 5 and in verse number 5, and this is where he talks about how tribulation produces uh, 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 perseverance and character and hope. He then said, hope does not disappoint. Our hope will not disappoint. I know that I've said this before. Uh, everything that we go through in this life, when this life is over, when we are in heaven, I, I'm fully convinced that we will not have been there five seconds before we will say it was worth everything. So let's resolve that we are going to live our lives with hope. Even in these uncertain times, how is your hope. And with that, I commend this lesson unto you. If you would, please bow with me at this time. But dear God and our Heavenly Father, once again we come to you thankful that you have loved us, thankful for all that you have done for us in this life. And we pray that you will continue to provide for us and that even if things are not the way that we think they ought to be or we do not understand how things are going, help us to never fail to put our trust in you. Help us to hope in you. Help us to hope in your word and, and the promises that you've said await us when this life is over. And help us to let that hope get us through as we deal with whatever struggles are coming our way. We pray that you will go with us through this day and through this week, and we pray that in all things you will be glorified in our lives. All this we ask through your Son's name, and amen. And again, I want to thank you for joining me with this study this morning. Uh, this afternoon, another lesson will be posted based upon Philippians chapter 4, the final verses of that particular text. So if you have opportunity, come back this evening for that particular study. But in the meantime, may, may God be with you. Go in peace and go in hope. Thank you.